Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Hump with Katie. I'm your host, Katie Thoreau, and I'm excited to bring you today's episode with bassist and way much more Hans Sturm and his amazing musical partner and wife, Jackie Allen. If you're new to The Hump, this is a series where I interview some of the world's most talented artists and musicians and find out why are they so amazing, how did it all happen, and ultimately, what can we learn from their journey? Before I bring you today's amazing episode, I'd love to thank our sponsors. And first up, we have the clothing company, Jams World. You guys, I absolutely love Jams World. I'm wearing a Jams right now of course and the reason why I love it is because the fabric is made from 100% spun crush rayon and it keeps me cool and comfortable they've been making clothing in Honolulu Hawaii since 1964 and the artwork is so unique it's screen printed right onto the fabric and it looks like a piece of art go to jamsworld.com and use the promo code jazz15 and you'll get 15% off your entire online purchase Next up, I'd like to thank Colstein's String Shop. I absolutely love Colstein's. They are doing amazing things for the bass community. They have two amazing locations in Long Island, New York, and a killer online store. Go to colstein.com and use the promo code KD10, and you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. All right, the time has come to bring you today's episode, and I'm so thrilled to share this interview with Hans Sturm, the bass and bass adore, and his musical partner, who also happens to be his wife, a fantastic jazz vocalist, Jackie Allen. There's so much information about Hans post-college and all the things that he's done, you know, Art of the Bow, that intricate DVD, and Art of the Left Hand with Francois Robath and the cutting edge technology he used, but I wanted to find out how he came to the bass, so we talked about that, and it was great to have Jackie there as well to talk about how they met, what it's like to just sing a duo with vocals and bass and how that came to be. They're both such creative musicians and they don't just play jazz or just play classical. So we also talk about creativity and music and how one person can just be creative in many different genres of music. And if you know Hans, you know how active he is in the bass community. He was past president of International Society of Bassists. And I thought I misread this, but it is true. He is the current president, again, of the ISB. So we talked about that and all the amazing things that the ISB is doing. Also, Hans and Jackie did a duo concert for the Colstein Music Relief Project, all original music of Hans. Be sure to check that out. I'll leave links down below. I know you're going to enjoy this interview. I had so much fun. So without further ado, here's Hans Sturm and Jackie Allen. Hans, there's a a lot of information about you, you know, with your schooling and and beyond that. But I want to know how you started with music and the bass in general, because you're you're like, you're such a dedicated bass ambassador. Ambassador, yeah. Ambassador, yeah. Um, wow. So we're we're going back to the early seventies. Uh, I was a violinist and was playing uh, in high school. I was I grew up in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, in Central Pennsylvania, and um, uh, had done the uh, district, regional, and all state stuff on violin. So I was a, a, a decent violinist. I can say, and uh, I was. I like to hang out in the music room. I like. I like to be around that. I joined the choir and so on. And the band director needed a bass player um, for the uh, for the jazz ensemble. And he was uh, he was very witty. Uh, Dean Doherty was his name. He's a very very smart guy. And he said, "Hey Hans, you like hanging out and playing music, don't you? You like jazz?" I was like, "Yeah, my father has a big collection of jazz." You know, there's not so much jazz violin, but there's a ton of jazz bass. Did you know that the bass is tuned just like a violin, only backwards? <laughs> and so, it's like, "Sure, I'll give it a try." You know, yeah. and so that's that's where it started. It it wasn't a great band. I mean, we were just playing, you know, stock arrangements, Neil Hefty and, um, uh, you know, Pink Panther theme and whatever was cool back in the back in the 70s but that that's how mercy, that's how mercy, that's mercy. Mercy, mercy mercy oh yeah <laughs> it yeah. wasn't even we weren't that cool yeah it wasn't even it wasn't even that and and so then i then the 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 bug bit me i went off to college uh and uh, uh, studied a wide range of stuff um, english and political science and philosophy uh, but kept monkeying around with the bass but i never thought i would be a bass player because i had studied so late mm. And uh, but I kind of got hooked, and then that's when I um, transferred to uh, Cincinnati Conservatory, where uh, Bill Grimes was teaching in the jazz area, and Barry Green was teaching in the classical area, and that's where I kind of got started. Yeah, that's that's kind of like a, a lot of people's origin story on playing bass. It's like either there was not enough bass players, and so you had to forego like playing the saxophone or violin or something, or you got to um, the first day of band class late, and that's all that was left. 
But part, you know, part of it was back in, in those days, it, you, you know, it's, it's like uh, uh, going to the circus. You have to be this tall to ride this ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. There, the mini bass program and all the stuff that, you know, Rodney Slatford and Carolyn Emery and George Vance, that, that they all kind of started with Stentor and none of that existed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like put the big kids on tuba and bass, and then there you <laughs> right, go. Totally. Right. Yeah. Um, now, I mean, I know you have your doctorate too, but I feel like you don't go by doctor. Um, the, the, I, for some of my students, they call me Doctor Hans or Doctor Sturm, and that's fine. But no, normally I'm Hans. Okay. Yeah, I was. Uh, I noticed that, and I was like, oh, okay. He's, he's just Hans. Well, my father was the egghead. My, uh -oh. my, my father was the one with, you know, a degree from the University of Chicago in, in, in ethical studies and so on. And so he, he was Dr. Stern. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and Jackie, I'm, well, I'm excited to see your concert together. Is it just duo for, for the Colstein concert? Yes. Oh, cool. There's nothing better than just bass and vocals, right? Yeah, or more challenging. It sounds like you do both at the same time. So. <laughs> yeah, but I'm crazy. I'm yeah, well, there's something not right up here <laughs> yeah um well cool so maybe we can kind of like uh converge converge your stories here so where where did you grow up i grew up in wisconsin and that's where we actually met and i could probably say because really because of richard davis wow i really thought about that until now but um yeah i had went to uw madison um grew up actually another reason i suppose i was attracted to hans because uh I grew up in a brass family, actually, and my father played uh, Dixieland tuba. Mm. So I grew up hearing, <clears throat> excuse me, like early jazz and, you know, multiple players. And it's, it's so common in, in Dixieland jazz that everyone's improvising at the same time. And it just sounds like a fun carnival. But you so, rebelled and you, you went with a string player. Yeah, yeah, I rebelled. <laughs> so, yeah, I played the French horn. My dad played tuba. So I grew up hearing the bass sound. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, was studying voice at UW-Madison and was frankly more interested in the jazz area. Mm -hmm. you know, it was just creative for me and fun, so I met Richard, and then through Richard, really, or that, that part of the program, uh, started seeing Hans, you know, going in, like, who's this guy coming in um, playing with the, the big band, and I was singing with the big band, and so we, we sort of started running past each other we, in that area. Yeah, right? we, we, yeah we, we, we met each other then, but we actually didn't get together until many years later. And mm -hmm. we performed together, actually voice and bass. He had in introduced me to the idea of that ensemble, if you will, you know, coupling, and he introduced me to uh, the music of um, Sheila Jordan. Mm -hmm. So I was like, wow, what is this stuff? So even, even, actually, as a duo, we played together. Yeah, we never dated, but we played together in, in college at, at some funky little clubs. Yeah, there was a, there was a club in, in, in Madison called the Barber's Closet. And it was, it was part of this train, actually this old train station yeah. uh, that had uh, turned into bars and clubs and still had an old uh, uh, hotel. And it was uh, down, downstairs, and, and you had to know how to get down there. And there, there was actually a, a working barber down there um, but there was this um, uh, kind of closet uh, but it was a, uh, a you know it had a glass case and you could see you know old razor blades and so on it was like a, and there was a there was a, a razor strap on the side and you pulled the razor strap and the door opened up oh wow so it was like a like a speakeasy with overstuffed yeah. furniture and stuff and so it was it was low ceiling very intimate a lot of frou frou cocktails, a lot of blender drinks, and so mm -hmm. on, which was a drag when you're doing a duo. But uh, it was very romantic, and so we played in the corner, and, mm -hmm. and people dug yeah. it. It was fun. I actually thought there's just no way this is going to go over, just the voice and the bass. But I was shocked when we started to perform that, and I could hear it myself that your ear fills in. You know, mm -hmm. As musicians, we kind of do anyway because we know the song. We can hear all the inner harmonies and the rhythm, but the audience seemed to hear what was missing as well. So, mm. you know, and so that was the new thing for me. But I thought, wow, the audience is actually digging this. Just they, the voice it, and yeah. the bass. Yeah, they were accepting it. So, you know, that that won me over. <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes we underestimate the general public yeah. and what and what they can handle. 
and even if it's subliminal you know obviously they were enjoying it and they weren't like oh i need drums i need piano it was just they they got it yeah oh that's very cool and you know i i think about this a lot too you guys both i mean i grew up in la so to me someone would be like oh you grew up in wisconsin that seems like pretty remote you know what's happening there but you had people like Richard Davis and, and Hans coming through and like these cl- clubs to play. So did you feel like you were missing out on that bigger city experience or, you know, New York no, or something? Jackie, you know, Jackie's career took off. I mean, she she uh, left the university, went to Milwaukee and was playing with Mel Ryan five nights a week at the Wyndham Hotel. Mel Ryan, of course, is the great organist and keyboard mm-hmm. player with West Montgomery. And then yeah. she moved so to I Chicago. Really, yeah, I and cut my teeth. With, with him, essentially, so I'm already playing with just heavy cats, so it mm-hmm. was a much easier jump for me to go f- from Milwaukee to Chicago, and that just opened up a world, and, and very, very uh, welcoming Chicago, mm-hmm. I was surprised, you know, it's like people just invited you to sit in, and they, we had a lot of uh, combos, I mean, it was just a city of combos, it was really easy to get, to get work and mm. to play. I'm not sure it's quite the same now, but it was at the time. Well, I, th- I, I think it's more. I think it's more challenging with some of the venues. But I mean, Chicago. Uh, was t- talking with um, uh, with Neil Tesser about this, and uh, he was a great critic and did some of the liner notes for Jackie over the years. Uh, uh, but he was he's talking about like this this idea about a city that can actually sustain a jazz scene, meaning that uh, there are at least a certain core number of players who can make a living mm-hmm. uh, playing jazz. And uh, that's become more and more challenging, but Chicago, that's certainly the case. We found, it, we're, we're in Lincoln, Nebraska. We found we're just, you know, we're three hours from Kansas City. That's the case down there. Um, but there are places that are you know, relatively large cities that just don't have that same kind of scene or same kind of history. Yeah, no, no that, that's very true. and, and uh... I think people don't realize that there's other places than New York or like big cities where th- things are happening. And there's always there's always a group of musicians somewhere that are that are doing it at a, at a high level too. Yeah, yeah. I think jazz and musicians, you know, were innately creative, and so that goes that extends extends itself as far as trying to be to find work, be entrepreneurial, and we'll see. A, I, I remember that at UW Madison. It's like we. People didn't offer us gigs. We yeah. had to create them, and so we didn't. I didn't think twice about that. It's, I just thought that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. I think that's what's happening now too. I, a lot of people, you know, older older musicians are like, "Oh, there's no more gigs for the younger people," and it's like, you you find a way, you know, you yeah. you make things, you make things happen. Right. Yeah. One of my one of my former students has been in LA for some years now, John Kibler, and he's got a duo called We Are the West. And uh, his his uh, the guy he's working is a duo guitar and he's the guitarist sings and he plays the bass, and evidently they've got some connection with parking garages in L.A. So on a, at, at an off hour, they will go down into the basement of a parking garage, set up a bunch of chairs and a small stage, and and and, and do shows in parking garages in L.A. You know, acoustic. He's he's yeah. He's playing, yeah, R- Radovan Law's old bass. Who, that, cool. that bass was played in the Chicago Symphony Orchestra is now being played in, in parking garages in L.A. What a fun story. It's nice yeah. and cool. You don't yeah. have to worry yeah. about rain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and you can park your car right there and then take out your bass. It's like the easiest load-in. Right. The acoustics Easiest load-in ever. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why not, right? Why not? Um, so, Hans, I want to get more deep into your ambassadorship i mean you just seem like you're like a scientist of the base or like a lifelong student a searcher so where did that interest come from and i have a feeling it's not just base maybe like everything you do is like you kind of go in depth but where did that fascination come from i i don't know uh (laughs) i i I mean i guess i i go back to family um uh, my 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 mom was an English teacher, English professor, uh, and teacher at the high school. Uh, my dad was a professor. But there was always lots of reading material around the house. Uh, Chicago was famous for the the great book series, and we had the you know the leather clad great books, and so those were around. And and we he subscribed to. 
I don't know, we had maybe a dozen magazines and five or six newspapers coming through the house <laughs> at any one time. And so for anything that might pop up and, you know, Dad would see me reading. I was a voracious reader as a kid. I think that was part of it. But Dad would see me reading something, and then he'd say, oh, I see you reading this article about so-and-so. You ought to check, you know, that same issue is being dealt with, you know, over here. You ought to check out the Atlantic issue or the New Yorker issue or the mm. In These Times. And, you know, uh, and so that was kind of always a, a little bit there that there was there was always more than one perspective to something. Uh, a very very uh, interesting take so I think that had uh, had had something to do with it but yeah and in, in, in the base yeah in for a in for a penny in for a pound as the Brits would say <laughs> yeah it just it um, I became very very curious and I, you, you may be alluding to some of the DVD work mm -hmm. that was that was uh, kind of a happy happy accident with uh, with Francois Rabat yeah how long did that take you to put together the the art of the bow and, and yeah each dvd was a five-year process so it, it 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 was i mean part of the issue was funding mm -hmm. um, but part of the issue was the um was the logistics so uh um, for instance uh for the art of the left hand um which is a two dvd set um uh, we brought and I was working with uh, Jackie, one of uh, Jackie's younger brothers on that as well. He was the videographer on that, uh, uh, Randy. But uh, w we had a um, human performance laboratory at Ball State University where I was teaching at the time. And there's a backstory there about how we got, it, got into it. But what we wanted to do, the, the art of the bow, the software stayed in the uh, biomechanics um, application. But what we wanted to do was to create a virtual Francois. <laughs> and we got the students at Ball State and they designed the cutest Francois ever with the chain. We slimmed him down about 35, 40 pounds. Uh, we measured his bow, we measured his base. But the problem was, uh, first of all, was that each item, you have the base player mm -hmm. uh, with the arms and everything. And in the case of the art of the left hand, we had uh, uh, balls that were, um, uh, painted with uh, reflective paint mm -hmm. that were glued to each knuckle as he played. And so obviously, occasionally, they would fly off and then you would have to start over again. Uh, we had about uh, 45 uh, high-speed capture cameras surrounding him. Um, uh, but what we wanted to do was then to take that biomechanics information and we wanted to export it into an animation program. Mm -hmm. So we could, we could have a, a kind of a cool animation. The problem was that you have the dots that comprise Francois, you have the dots on the bow, and you have the dots on the base, and they all had to dance together. And that was the issue because we didn't have, it was, uh, what was the name of the movie that came out? Um, a Avatar. Oh yeah. We, we didn't have that kind of budget, right? We had students designing this stuff. And so, but what happened was the, the dots are, are, are moving in, in space but the base is not designed perfectly and uh, uh, the animated base and so sometimes the arm would go through the base mm. or the bow would go you know so it it, it didn't it, it didn't quite work one of the other issues that we had at the beginning was we had dots all over his body and the animation program what we know what we knew what we came to know was you needed to have uh the subject do a t pose oh okay with a still and you had to define each point starting with, I think it was the right foot. And so the animation, I know this is crazy, right? It's really wacky. Yeah. I'm sure it's all changed now. But, but the, the, so when the first motion occurs, the animation program assumes that's the right foot because it doesn't have a T-pose. Mm. So Francois starts to move his bow arm and his leg goes, whoa. Oh, that's funny. And we were, we, we were just like, you know, pu pulling our hair out, trying to figure it out. Um, and it took us a long time. But the, the, the good news in the story was um, uh, we got a hold of the company. We finally found the person who could tell us, yes, this is how you need to do mm. this. Then we had to bring Francois back. So there were all of these things that kind of, you know, pu pu pushed it back in addition to raising the funds just to get the thing, to get the thing done. We, I, I got a lot of support from, from Ball State University. 
I I think that origin story is funny. We're on an airplane and and saw a magazine article. Oh, you. you, Well, how how do you (laughs) came up with the idea in the first? Well, yeah, I I was I was guessing like you weren't an expert at this type of animation. No, no, no. I know nothing. I had not. Yeah. I had I had had no clue. Um, I was going back and forth to see Francois and. You know, in uh, uh, the third volume of his book, there are 160, uh, 140 uh, fingering variations. Mm -hmm. And you can tell what he intends for the fingering because you see the number or the name of the string below and you see the finger above and you kind of have the idea. You don't really know, but you have an idea about what the motion is. Mm -hmm. You can figure that out. But in the Boeing, the early version, it was a a pullout. And Mm -hmm. there were 250 some different Boeings. And you see this large slur, and you see dots. So you see this large slur, and you see dashes. But you have no idea what does that mean, what does that sound like. And so I'm going through this with him, and I'm getting frustrated because I, I don't quite understand. And he's, and then he, he says to me at the end of that lesson, which was my last lesson before I came back to the States, this is my fear. Uh, famously, this is my fear that I'm not going to be able to transmit my bow arm. And uh, I said, oh, no, 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 we're, 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 we're going to be there with a syringe, all the bass players, we're going to get a DNA thing, and we're all going yeah, to yeah, yeah. have you. you know. But that, that really kind of stuck with me, and so we, we got onto the plane. I got on the plane to, to, to come back home, and there was a part that was missing, something was happening, and it was during lunchtime, and so the captain came on and said it's going to be an hour because they, at this time, the union was very, I think still as strong, they were going to have a break. And so I asked for something to read, and they gave me a, a, a golf magazine. I don't play the game. But I just opened it up, and there was an article about it, the Tiger Woods video game that was brand mm. new at that, at that time. And they had Tiger up on the golf course. Then they had him in the skin-tight black suit with reflective markers. And then they had a picture of Tiger, and they claimed that they had captured Tiger's swing. Mm. And I had an epiphany. If they can do this for this silly game... It's just, it's just the way that they're describing it. I mean, they're, just, they're, they're describing this to the layperson because they're describing this to golfers. Yeah. It's like, this is, these are sticks. Mm-hmm. We have a stick and we have a hinge. You put the marker at the hinge, you can see then how, how does it move. And it was just like, and then I called, I called over to the biomechanics lab, but they were doing things uh, for geriatrics, uh, mm. studies, walking studies, and also for athletics. Uh, but they were very curious about that, and that's how that, we, that, that's how that started yeah oh yeah i'm sure it was a huge contribution to to the school you know the work the work you did oh yeah well that and that and financially i mean uh, the, the the university has the copyright to these so uh, uh there's a you know there are royalties that get paid but mm-hmm. it's it's like a, it's like a publishing deal you know and so and that they they did uh they did quite well for the university they were very happy with that they, they, they were not so happy when i well, I actually retired. I, I had been there for uh, more than 15 years um, uh, and was over 50, so I could, I could retire and mm-hmm. be professor emeritus. But they, the, the Office of Research Studies was, was not happy that I was going. <laughs> they, they would have liked to have seen me do something with um, Midori or, you know. Yeah. Yeah, back up the cash truck and the lawyers. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Francois did it because... The I'm love of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. Um, oh, that that's fascinating. And what a fun, like, you probably never thought, oh, I'm going to be, you know, capturing, animating Francois Barboth one day. <laughs> oh, and it was fun to see him. He was seemed to me like he was just totally into it, you know, mm-hmm. wearing the, the black stretchy jacket and the stings on him. And, and to- I mean, he, it was so oh, much the, fun. <laughs> the, the, the outtakes on the DVD are hilarious. Oh he's, wow! He's got he's got this headband with markers. He's still wearing his chains, and he's got all this going on. He's whoa 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 whoa. Am I sexy in all this? <laughs> oh my gosh! So so we put some of those at the end as, as the credits are rolling, so you get a chance to see it. Just he just yeah he enjoyed himself. Oh that that's always nice. Um, well, I noticed. I mean, with both of you, I mean Jackie and Hans, that. Um, it's like music is just music. It's not like, oh, you just play jazz or classical or something for, for both of you. So, I mean, so I'll pose this question to, to both of you. I mean, why, uh, why is that? I mean, ja- I was listening to your music, Jackie, and, and it's, it's nice. It's like there is, you know, some things that you're like, oh, that's jazz. And then, oh, this is a little bit more folk or, or something like that. So why, 
Why? Why do you like to do that? Um, I'm just honoring my own creativity and what comes to me. And I feel like if I can make it, if I make it my own, it feels like it's more genuine. I try, try to, that's the whole point of, to me, of being a jazz musician is trying to be a creative musician. And so however something speaks to me, if I honor that, I know it's going to be, it's going to be true. If, it, if it speaks to me, I'm going to enjoy it. And mm -hmm. perhaps someone else would enjoy it as well. Yeah, because I got the the picture. It's not like sometimes I'll hear an artist and you're kind of like, oh, they're doing this pop song because they think someone's going to like it. Or like you can kind of tell like, oh, that's not really what they want to do. But I could tell everything you you're producing is like is you. So I appreciate that. Well, I could, it, I'm going to oh. say it doesn't always turn out like I intend. And so that's part of that's part of the game too. You're oh, yeah. With a whole bunch of creative musicians. So my original intention when we begin to re to rehearse, record something, I'm thinking this way, but if I just open myself up to what everyone else offers, the end result will be different and there's a good chance it will be better. So yeah. I can only take this much credit for anything that <laughs> I've recorded. And this is this is the, the the band has been playing with Jackie uh has been together for uh, over 20 years. I mean, it's the same group of people. Uh, the percussionist Dane Richardson and I go back 30 years, and he studied in Ghana among the Iwi people. He studied in Matanzas, Cuba. He studied in Bahia, Brazil. And so he brings, I mean, a ryth rhythmic vocabulary that's mind-blowing and, and can move between these things and create new stuff. So that creates a whole other thing. John Mulder, uh, the guitarist, uh, can play classical, acoustic, but can also, you know, with, with the Paul Wurtico trio, uh, for instance, Paul was Pat Metheny's drummer for many years, will just totally rip your head off with a, with mm -hmm. a rocket screaming, distorted, he's, yeah. got a, he's got a little pedal, maybe I'm mm. giving away a trade secret, called the rat. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but when he steps on the rat, <laughs> it changes everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then and then pianists we've had uh, we've had a few uh, Lawrence Hobgood has played but uh, Ben Lewis is just a marvelous uh, a marvelous musician but I think to that to, to to your point I mean part of it was I think Jackie had a lesson earlier on was with with, with Eddie Higgins oh yeah and with with Eddie Higgins and Richard in a recording session where yeah did a recording session and uh, I was totally steeped in Nancy Wilson at at the time, you know, it kind of started with Ella, and it mm. just keeps morphing. And who's the next person you're just gonna just yeah. devour, you know? So I was really into Nancy Wilson, and I was actually recording one of the songs she had recorded. And we finished, and I was so proud of myself. We got it together, and it was after the recording, and he pulls me aside, said, "Stop listening to her. If you want to be true to yourself." don't record any of the songs that she's recorded. And I was just, cr you know, crestfallen, but it only took, took me a few minutes to realize what he was really saying to me. If mm -hmm. you want to be your own person, you, you've got to now just assimilate all the things, but just not any one person. Just trust your own voice. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was just great to hear. And great. good good that you yeah. were open to hear it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that what you were yeah, to. yeah, that's exactly what. I, but but I mean, there's there's certain tunes. I mean, uh, um, for that, I can say they, they didn't catch on, you know, with Jackie's recordings. But tunes that that I felt were particularly effective, that were very creative. I mean, her version of uh, "Born to Be Blue," um, where it's a famous Mel Torme tune, and he's for those that don't know, you know, he he wrote the the Christmas song "Chestnuts Roasting on." Everybody knows that tune. But Born to be Blue is, is uh, really dark lyrics. Mm -hmm. And she just swiped out all the lyrics and just had the bass playing uh, uh, these minor tenths. Right. And then she floats the melody. Some folks, well, you should sing it. I can't sing, but <laughs> we're born, born to be. Some folks meant to live in clover. But they are such a chosen few, right? But clover being green is something I've never seen because I oh, was born like to be blue, Yeah, I think right? how dark can you go, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, 
mean, six feet under dark. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. And, but then, like, you know. yeah, and then, and, and then, and then messing with the bridge where it's just one long walk up. So mm. then we kind of get this feeling, and then the bottom drops oh, out yeah, of it yeah. again. Yeah. It's so it's having fun, you know, crushing. having fun with uh, arrangements. Like, how can you rearrange something for mm -hmm. a combo? And that was a, a, also a fun creative process for me. I think I enjoy that more than, say, scatting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. Because you, especially as a vocalist, you've got. And creating like, my own landscape to yeah. sing over. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I got my own bass player. player. Right. Yeah. That's kind of nice to have around the house. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Either your own piano player or your own bass player. I think well, having a bass player is best. It's, yeah. It's, so nice to have a player. so nice to have a bass around the house. It, yeah, yeah, definitely like a, a Bob yeah. Duro right. could could write a right, song right, on that. Bob Duro. Oh my goodness. Or yeah. Dave, yeah, um, Dave Bridgeport. Dave Bridgeport. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Hans, for you, because uh, you you play. Sometimes people are like, especially in either world, they're like, "Oh, you play jazz and classical. You must, you know." be subpar at both of them which is not the case for you and some people are like you have to do just one thing to to be great at it which i, I don't think obviously is your living proof um so ha have you ever gotten any any backlash for that and i can just tell you enjoy music so much oh yeah yeah of course but the people you know uh, uh when when we when we moved here 10 years ago um i i decided because i had been doing a lot of orchestral freelancing because there's this there's money in that, you know. If you you, you get on the sub list and, and mm -hmm. you, can, you, you know you, you get a week of a week of work and you you, you walk away with some with some money, um, so uh, I decided that I, I wasn't I wasn't going to do that. I still sub occasionally, but I wasn't going to go on the sub list for this or that. I, I wasn't going to audition for the uh, the regional orchestras as a, as, a, as a member of the. And ensemble. no more Nutcracker. Well, I, I, I'm going to play Nutcracker again this year. Wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. But it's only, to, it's not like when, when I was principal of basically Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra, I mean, we had a dozen performances in over two weeks, and it was yeah. just, oh, yeah. yeah. So, but, but you know, I, I want my, here I have a, a, a bigger studio of players. I want the students to have a, a, a chance to play and so on. I, I also want to get into my own thing. I mean, we... Most of the pieces that the pieces that we played, oh, I think all the pieces that we played for, um, for the uh, relief project uh, for for Colsteins, uh, were off the new um, Nebraska project. Yeah, all original music that mm. he wrote. So but he the, took the time, had the time to do it. Right, but at, at, at the same time, I have Voyage. Uh, it, it just got finished too, which is an homage to Francois Rabat, and it's his unaccompanied works. Mm. But you know, people in the orchestra. Uh, if they see a jazz, they see a jazz. Oh, I didn't know you played yeah. jazz, and and you get that with some of the, um, you know, some of the jazz folks too. They, for whatever reason, they go to see. Oh, um, Diane Schur is singing with uh, or They want to go hear her, and then, you know, either I'm playing, I might be playing in the rhythm section, or mm -hmm. I might be just standing back in the bass section. It's like, oh, I saw you at the, you know, yeah, at Diane Schur. I didn't know you did that. That, yeah, that, that kind of stuff happens. But I think for everybody, especially for the bass players, you know, everything's open to you. Mm -hmm. And you've got you've got players who go. But I mean, John Clayton's, a, you know, brilliant, brilliant case in point. Um, Rob Cassinger, who plays the Chicago Symphony, is a great jazz bass player. I mean, there there are uh, a lot of bass players. When you play the instrument well, you, these opportunities uh, present themselves. That's one, it. One my, yeah. One of my teachers was. Um, uh, oh uh, goodness! I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna space his name. Oh dear, this is very embarrassing. He was also the teacher of uh, Tony Bianco when I was in high school. He was principal of Pittsburgh Symphony. Uh, brilliant, brilliant orchestral player. But in one of his lessons, he he he's oh you play some jazz, and so he started to play some jazz, and then he picked up the bow and he played uh, uh, the bridge to Round Midnight in harmonics. Mm. And just like between artificial harmonics and regular harmonics. Yeah. Like, wow, man. <laughs> this guy's principal of Pittsburgh Symphony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think bass players are, have a different, operate obviously on a different wavelength, you know. So I think it's a little, we're a little bit more cool. But I won't take up too much more of your time. But I, I like that 
so you're not on the sub list where you are right now because it is it and you because you have students and is it kind of more of like i've done that let you know an opportunity for somebody else yeah and there's there's only so much time mm -hmm. you know and I, so I, I will go play i mean uh, uh i just i just tell the 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 person I'm manager when they when when they call you know yeah if you're doing shasti five and you need another horse in the back but that's that's absolutely fine but you know i want i want a place for my i mean i played a, a concert um oh, it's been a few years ago we were doing uh i think it was bartok concerto for orchestra but what 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 gassed me was i had four former students in the section at mm -hmm. the same time and that was like a, and i almost felt out of place it's like Okay, old man, you need to. Yeah. <laughs> now he won't. He out. won't turn down a, a, a local jazz gig, you know, especially if it's no. you know if his if it's his buddies. Yeah. So he 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 performs every weekly. I would say yeah. Some some live thing. I mean pre COVID. Pre COVID. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. There's always something going on, and the community yeah. here is 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 very supportive and beautiful that way. We've got we've got players who are Tom Larson is a brilliant. Jazz pianist, I think of him as a, he's a huge Bill Evans fan, but he's got his own aesthetic, the way that he plays. But he plays like he plays like a composer, not like a pianistic jazz mm -hmm. player. So my image of him is a little bit like this, like he's listening and waiting to hear for that thing. Yeah. And when that thing comes, it's the juiciest voicing right, you ever yeah. want to hear it's like, <laughs> right he takes the time to create yeah those sounds so we, we for instance we, we just got a call this this is a imagine this you know it's a call for a society gig the woman calls turns out that she and her husband own a uh, a local bar but they make their own cider it's mm -hmm. a cider bar different flavors and so on and she says to me i know you and and, and tom you know, love to play jazz, and and I, I think I saw. Didn't you do a Bill Evans concert a little bit ago? I said yes, we did. Well, my husband's uh, turning fifty, and his favorite recording is uh, Sunday uh, live at the <laughs> live at the Vanguard. Mm -hmm. Would you come play the record live mm. for his birthday? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> when do you get a call like that? Exactly. That was just, that was just outrageous. So we're gonna have a lot of fun. Yeah. And they're oh. going to import a, a, a grand piano if, she, to their home. She, yeah, she, she, she's going she's to well. bring. Yeah, she's going. She's going to move Tom's piano from his house into the into the bar, so we can he can play on his own instrument. Well, there you go. And uh, hopefully, her birthday is coming up soon, and you'll find out where her favorite record is. Exactly. Now you're, <laughs> you're thinking. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, cool. I think my last question is more along the lines of of both of your passions. But Hans, I know you've you're a past president of ISB. You're still very, very involved. Um, so what is it like to be, I, I love the bass community, by the way, this, the international bass community is so much fun. Um, so what, what has your experience been just being involved with ISB? Well, actually, I got to tell you, I'm president again. Okay, I thought I did see that, but I, I was like, am I mistaken? Yeah, it's the first I, time I understand it's that the that's first happened. time. Yeah, well, we did. We, but we, uh, Barry was sort of acting president for many years. Barry Green, oh, and then and then Jeff Bradetich was, I think, seven years something like that. Okay. And they both. This was after Gary Carr founded the organization, mm -hmm. and of course he was there for many years. And then there was sort of a year hiatus. And everything. anyway, the whole history. You can read the whole history on isbworldoffice <laughs> dot com. Uh, I had not intended to continue on. I was. Uh, yeah, my shelf life was, um, yeah, longer than a Twinkie's. I should have, I should have stepped off. <laughs> uh, so, but we had, we, we uh, Nicholas Walker had changed the way the board operated. Um, the board had operated in a, in a fashion where uh, bass players who were on the board represented a, and we just got done talking about this, a certain style of music. Mm -hmm. Or they were a teacher, or they were whatever, and uh, uh, he brought in with some consultation uh, uh, somebody to come in and talk about okay, how does the organization work? What are best practices? And basically, she said, uh, the woman who came in said, 
what are you doing? This is not a good idea. What you need to have are people that fulfill specific roles. And uh, that changes the complexion uh, completely. So that was six years ago. Mm-hmm. When I think that's six years ago, because he just he just stepped off. So it's it's two years president elect when he designed the convention. So this last convention was the one that the, the, I had designed two actually because we had we had anticipated it was going to be in person and then mm-hmm. had to pivot to online. Uh, two years as president elect doing that. Two years as president running the board, and then two years as past president. So you always have kind of three people in the pipeline helping to run the organization, which I think is a very smart way to run. Mm-hmm. But when we did that, uh, when that move was made, uh, then the question was, okay, so you're sort of representing this group of people, but now what can you bring to the table in terms of a role, like marketing, development, uh, treasurer, secretary, um, you know, these uh, young basis, these are the kinds of of things that we're looking for now. Um, And because I have, a history of running a couple of non nonprofits, working with nonprofits with the um, a Madison Music Collective, which is still going since 80, 82 or eighty four, yeah. a long, mm-hmm. long, long time. Maybe it's eighty four, uh, and then the uh, Metal Art Music Festival here here in Lincoln. Uh, Nick asked me if I wouldn't mind going over the bylaws and then writing an operations manual, which we didn't have, mm. and so I got into that creating these things from scratch and, and, and each time I would bring another iteration forward to the board. So there are a dozen, 15 iterations before they were approved. The bylaws are wholly writ because that's, an, that's a legal agreement with the IRS. So mm-hmm. you have to be careful that you don't define things too specifically. But the operations manual is a living document. It's how we do business and how things, how things go. And so that was evolving. So I had just gotten done doing all of that and was and we, we had to elect now before the, the outgoing president would appoint somebody to become president-elect mm. in consultation with the executive board. Now the operations manual said we have to have an election and the executive board would accept nominations and so on and so. I got through all of this stuff and passed the thing and I'm bowing out and I get this phone call two weeks later. Nicholas said, you've been nominated. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like... As I thought that when he called, I thought there was a problem. With the yeah, yeah. Manual. And uh, I said, oh, Nick, no. And he said, no, I want you to seriously consider this, and, and here's why. And we went into this discussion. And so I said, okay, if those folks who have been nominated, because this wasn't part of the operations manual, each of them wrote a, a bio, because mm-hmm. the board is relatively large, 20 people. Not everybody knows everybody. Yeah. A short bio. And your vision for uh, the ISB. If everybody writes that, and then they then they read that, and they, they then they vote for me, then I will accept it. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. Um, so anyway, it was a, it, it was a, the the convention was just I I have never been so stressed. Oh, this past one. Oh, oh online and yeah. so much work. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the videos and stuff you would I don't know what you would think, but it was I can get on a soapbox about that, but I won't. It was it was very challenging. But it came off exceedingly well and I think that the next one for sure will be some kind of hybrid because we can reach people who can't travel. Oh my and gosh, I lo- I I did one one day of it and I I th- it was seamless on my end, you know. And I had so much fun, you know, working with the younger, the younger students. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That, and that was that was on the Zoom uh, on the ISB Zoom account completely. That wasn't on the Cvent account. So uh, that you know what what uh, Wesley Thompson and Tracy Rowell did in designing that was just out of sight. And and yeah, they're 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 both just totally brilliant. And uh, Wesley, especially regarding the technology aspect of it. So she's taken over now as, as secretary and is going to help with uh, Travis Harrison um, working on the base camp and the communications between folks. So it's really it's really quite brilliant. I, I'm, I'm very, very excited. We have uh, a representative from the PAGE panel, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, gen- gender um, equity. And uh, also now we have uh, a new diversity team as well. So uh, both of those are now a, a, a part of the board, which I'm uh, super excited about. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with the way things are going, and we just had, yesterday we had our, our first meeting uh, with the new board, and just got to know each other a little bit and chat about 
how the board works and everything, and this is a, a tremendous group of people. I'm, I'm very excited to see the possibility that's going to come. But I, I love this organization. I mean, you know, I, I, and what surprised me when you speak about this, the, the, the business about um, stylistic and so on, I can remember a concert. I may, I may have conflated a couple things, so I might not have this exactly right, but I want to say it was a duet concert with Peter Kowald and Teppo Hataao. It was a free improvisation, and I remember quite distinctly Teppo, uh, no, Peter, uh, uh, detuning his E string so he could pull it out like this away from the bass uh -huh. and bowing it so it sounded like a lion the size of a hippopotamus. It mm -hmm. was just this roar kind of sound, and Teppo being Teppo is tapping on the bass and yeah, so yeah. on. And I'm looking around, and um, uh, David Walters is there, and Frank Proto is there, and it's like all of these cats that I would have thought would have been listening to this classical player in another room mm -hmm. playing some, you know, amazing, amazing stuff over here. But they were here in, in, in this space, uh, and it was just that experience of seeing these icons, yeah. like, like the most avant-garde thing you could possibly hear. That's where, that's where they were. Yeah. So anyway, that was that was that was eye opening. Yeah, I, bass players are ear are, opening. are open. Ear yeah. opening. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Oh, that yeah, that's fantastic. Um, well, I'm, yeah, I'm so so excited for the next the next convention to see what's oh, going to be happening. Yes, join the ISB. We have now an e membership, uh, so you can get the magazine online. I think it's I think it's twenty five bucks a year. So it's, oh yeah. Really, I can really even, I can say as a non-bass playing uh, musician that uh, I've had more fun at, at some of these conventions because I've been to many of them performing. It's just a fantastic group of individuals. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I could never imagine attending a, a, a vocal conference or convention. <laughs> it would just be divas everywhere. But There's something about bass really players. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah exactly. Back spent, to the buzz. Yeah, yeah. We, we spent all our lives... Supporting. Mostly supporting other people, not in, not in the limelight. I mean, we do have some that are coming up, you know. Mm -hmm. Of course, Edgar, but, but you know, Xavier Foley, for instance. Mm -hmm. We've got some folks who are really doing, doing, doing great stuff. But they're still, even with that, super supportive. Oh, yeah. Know, wa wa wanting to help each other all the time. And so the hangs are, uh, are, are epic. It's yeah, been so much fun to see the bass players in the limelight, mm -hmm. right? to move forward and now I get to be the leader. I get to be the soloist. I get to do all this creative stuff and you see them playing all together. You know, it's it's just great fun. It's the bass love. That's what it is. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. Um well cool. I'm gonna we'll we'll call it there. I really appreciate you both taking the time and I'm really looking forward to checking out your concert uh this this week. I think it'll be happening this Wednesday, I think the 15th, if I'm not, September 15th, if I'm not mistaken, and it'll s probably stay online. Um, we don't have to give anything away. I'll, you already said it's going to be some original music and just, just bass and voice, so I'm looking forward to that. And thank you. It was so so great to meet the both of you. I hope I look forward to the day of seeing you in person. Oh, well, thanks, Katie. Katie. Yeah, yeah. And if you see, uh, uh, let's see. I don't know. If, I don't know that you would find the uh, "We Are the West" and see John Kibler, but uh, well, if I'm parking somewhere, I'll let you know. Parking somewhere. Yeah. Or, uh, uh, Lyman Medeiros is another. Uh, oh yeah. Who's out there, um, who's doing great stuff. So, anyway. Yeah. Well, well yeah. Thanks. Well, quick, quick story, because uh, we've we've got our our base love ambas ambassador out here is John Clayton, yeah. and uh, so every once in a while he'll put together he's so selfless and so he'll get offered a concert to do something somewhere and mo most often he'll he'll put a big bass group together and he calls it bass monsters so <laughs> we'll have it. um we've done a couple of these together and, and lyman's been in it and it's i think it's nine bass players including himself and so we'll do something maybe one or two things together with nine bass players and then we'll break it down and of course john's like it's the same thing okay we'll play something you know very very in the jazz idiom and then he'll take out some chopin thing that he's arranged and it's like yeah you're gonna play all the way up there and you're gonna do this and then but this last one here and he'll just arrange something like that so 
he brought in a piece for one bass. So one person was holding the bass, and uh, so it was nine of us playing the bass. And so we all had our part, and we had to we memorized our part. And I, I was playing below below the bridge, something ry rhythmically on the strings. But he's just he's amazing. So he keeps our community going. That's Absolutely. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. They they have uh, uh, my friend Johnny Hamill who teaches uh, young bassists uh, from from age three through through high school down in Kansas City. He's got a a, a big studio. He they have a group in um, in Kansas. It's the Wyandotte. County, they call themselves the, the Wyandot Lowriders, <laughs> and it's a bit like those darn accordions uh, uh, up in San Francisco area. You know, it's it's however many bass players show up uh, and a drummer, mm -hmm. and uh, so they, they they play all the you know all the heavy metal tunes and a country tune and a whatever and don't maybe somebody don't, 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 don't yeah, yeah. Don't I am Iron Man, you know and. And maybe somebody knows the melody, or maybe they don't, and they just jam on the bass line. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not as not as sophisticated as pulling out the Chopin, but it's yeah, it's it's great fun with a shot and a beer. Creative. Exactly. Yeah, 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 awesome. Well, I, I just thought of one more quick thing for from from the ISB from my experience when I did the young. I think one morning they had me lead like a warm up, and uh, and so there's people from all over, and there was this small small girl she was six years old from somewhere in england and i said well, let's all warm up on an f major scale whether you can do one two or three octaves and we'll just do that and she unmutes her microphone and she goes excuse me i don't know what the f major scale is it was much cuter than that and um it was just <laughs> but it was so um so beautiful for me to just explain okay so you know that lowest string do you know what that's called and she goes the e string and i said now just put your first finger right there and it was just so cool to be able to you know she's however many miles away and just be able to show her a one octave f major scale and that's the isb <laughs> i love it i love it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 make those connections it's beautiful yeah uh, well thank you jackie and hans i so appreciate it and uh i'll i know i'll see you guys in person yeah We'll be out in L.A. sometime, for sure. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.